Hello, welcome to this pragmatic guide to active learning from the MSc in Medical Education at the Swans University Medical School. What I hope you're able to do by the end of this video is to describe some examples of active learning as a way of trying to define what it is, to describe some of the evidence base supporting or not the use of active learning, link the evidence and examples we've shown in the video to your own teaching practice, identify some pragmatic issues with the application of active learning. I'm going to give you the punchlines of what we're going to cover in this video. We're going to try and define what active learning is. And the punchline really is that it's hard to define. There are some things that go into active learning that we can define quite well, but as a general concept, it's quite difficult to pin down. Nevertheless, if we ask the question, does it work? There's a lot of good evidence to support the use of active learning, particularly in STEM and medical education type subjects that we might be interested in. The final question then, is active learning useful? The answer there is, it depends. There is some evidence, as I've said, to support the fact that active learning works. But in particular in this video, we're really going to have to think about some of the pragmatic considerations that go into us deciding whether or not to use a particular teaching technique. And that's going to be informed by us trying to understand exactly what active learning is. So let's start with that. There's a lot of definitions out there for active learning. I'm going to give you one of the most common from the literature, from Bonwell and Einstein in 1991. Anything that involves student doing things and thinking about the things that they're doing. And that's not a particularly useful definition. There can be lots of things that are unrelated to learning that students might be actively thinking about and doing. That's the commonly cited definition, a snippet taken from Bonwell and Eisen. It's not all that useful as we've seen, but as is so often the case, it's helpful to go back to the original paper to get a bit more detail. This is the paragraph that precedes that definition I just showed you. Analysis of the research literature suggests that students must do more than just listen. They must read, write, discuss, or be engaged in solving problems. This really does take us to one of the key definitions of active learning, but unfortunately, active learning is often defined by what it's not, and it is not simple didactic lecturing with no interaction whatsoever. There's a lot of research studies looking at active learning, as we'll see later on, and in many cases, the control condition is a didactic lecture. Active learning has been advocated by many people as a response to the widespread use of lecturing in higher education and in other forms of education. I think it's safe to say that that would be a reasonable definition that people might come to when asked to define what active learning is. It's not lectures. However, that doesn't really tell us much about what it is. Let's go back to that Bonwell and Eisen definition again. If we take the first sentence of that paragraph, an analysis of the research literature, in the original paper, Bonwell and Eisen cite a study, a review. We can go to that review and look at the research literature that's analysed, and unfortunately there isn't really any there. It's really an opinion piece about how to organise higher education. There isn't really a huge amount of research literature that supports then the following sentence. There is a lot of information out there about how students learn, about why people learn, and the sorts of ways we might deploy that in practice. We're going to cover some of them here, we're going to cover some of them in other videos elsewhere but it still doesn't get us any closer to an understanding of what active learning actually is. Nevertheless, I think it's safe to say that active learning is very popular. If you were to go to ERIC, the Education Resource Information Centre, basically a database of education research papers, and you were to type in the sentence active learning, you'd find a lot of papers. You'd find the numbers of papers have gone up steadily year on year. If you added them all together, you'd be looking at over 10,000 different papers across all different levels of education in multiple different settings using multiple different topics. Active learning clearly then is then a popular approach. That makes it even more important for us to try and understand what it is and also whether or not it works. Let's go straight to that second question then. Does active learning work? A lot of those 10,000 papers have tried to get to an answer to that question, get to an understanding of whether or not it's more effective than a more traditional form of teaching. Here is one of the better papers that attempts to answer that question. It's a meta-analysis of over 200 studies by Scott Freeman and Mary Wenderoth, along with lots of collaborators, and they looked at active learning in higher education and university-level STEM teaching. They meta-analyzed the studies to try and look at whether or not active learning was more effective and more supportive of students. They found that students who were taught using active learning had higher assessment scores, they were less likely to fail, and they were less likely to drop out, and all of these findings were statistically significant. The effect size that Wenderoth and co found was 0.47. That's quite a reasonable effect size, but if you don't have any context of what effect size means, there are other videos out there to explain it, but I'll give you some practical illustrations from Freeman et al. 
exam scores went up by an average of 6% in the active learning condition. Students who were involved in non-active learning conditions were 1.5 times more likely to fail. Those are quite profound differences and really do strongly support the use of active learning. However, there's much more that we need to consider when we're trying to determine whether or not active learning is a useful thing to do. And that's what we're really going to do in this video as part of our overall pragmatic approach to evidence-based education. Trying to understand the most useful evidence on a particular topic, our judgment about it, and the context in which we might apply. The question we want to ask then is, is active learning useful? And as I've already told you, the punchline to that is, sort of. Let me give you some more detail on that. If we go back to the Freeman et al. meta-analysis, Scott Freeman and Mary Wendroth and co, this is their definition of what active learning is. Active learning engages students in the process of learning through activities and or discussion in class, as opposed to passively listening to an expert. It emphasizes higher order thinking and often involves group work. Again, it's very difficult then to pin down what it actually means to say that people were using active learning, except to say that they weren't using lectures. Thankfully, Freeman et al. publish a detailed list of all the studies that they've analyzed in their meta-analysis, and we're able to go in there and look at the sorts of techniques that are used. The authors coded the studies according to the type of method that was used. We can do a simple analysis of that coding. You can see here that 66% of the studies in the analysis use some sort of worksheet, 17% of them use clickers, and 12% of them use quizzes. These things all have something in common. They're all some form of test or some form of active retrieval. If the question is then whether or not active learning is useful, I think it's reasonable for us to take apart active learning and say that some significant component of it clearly involves the use of retrieval practice, some form of testing or quizzing or other way of bringing information to mind. You'll see in a different video released this week, we've asked the question about whether or not retrieval practice is useful, and the answer is categorically yes, it is. That does get us some way towards in trying to understand what to do if we want to use active learning, build in some form of retrieval practice and we're some way towards it. That's not to say that active learning is just about using retrieval practice quizzes and worksheets. Within the studies there's a lot more going on as we'll see in the next couple of examples, but there's one other thing that helps us get to an answer about whether or not active learning is useful. And that is that about 50% of the studies in the analysis deployed active learning in some form of lecture theatre setting. This is to say they took a traditional large group teaching, it put in some form of initiative or intervention that involved worksheets or clickers or quizzes or a combination of those, and then found an improvement in learning. That is useful from a practical perspective because lots of the teaching that we have to do in STEM and medical education subjects is around, based around large groups. There are lots of other things involved in those studies, as I said, and we couldn't possibly go through all 225 of them or through all the 10,000 different active learning studies that have been published. But some common themes do emerge. Small group work is very commonly used. And you'll remember from the Freeman et al. definition of active learning, they said it very commonly involves using small group work and often involves active discussion. These can also do deploy elements of retrieval, actively processing, working with information, bringing it to mind. But it's a little more complicated to pin down which part of active learning is due to the quizzing or the retrieval practice and which group part of it is due to the interactions involved in small group learning or the discussion part. This does take us on then to what were some of the other studies that were used in the Freeman et al. meta-analysis. I think it's safe to say that not all active learning is the same. I'm going to give you one example that was included. It's from a study by Crider from 2004, looking at a form of active learning in astronomy education. The title of the paper is Hot Seat Questioning, a technique to promote and evaluate student dialogue. In this study, students were asked to come to the front of the class and answer questions from the instructor. The students were told when they were going to have to do this, they were given a timetable well in advance, and they were told they would have to prepare and then answer questions from the instructor in front of everybody else. This is clearly a different type of active learning to some of the other studies included and to some others in the literature. Having students come up and answer questions in front of their peers potentially adds a different motivation to the students to try and help them engage with their learning. And I'm not sure how popular that's going to be with the students. The students were asked to evaluate the different components of the class. They were asked which component of the class was most helpful in learning the material and the top rated one was listening to the instructor. 
Taking online pre-quizzes was also rated as most helpful by a third. Take the PowerPoint presentations by 26%. Only 6% of the students said that prepping for the hot seat was most helpful in learning the material, and another 6% were negative about the hot seat. This does lead us on to a very pragmatic question about active learning. What's the student's experience? Do they like active learning? A recent study by Desarius et al. attempted to look at just this. It was an experimental study that was very well done, as have many of the studies by Deslauriers and Alpine. Many of them have looked into active learning and they found positive effects. But in this one, they wanted to see what the students thought about those positive effects. The experimental study had two groups. There was a control group and an active learning group. Both were large classes and both were given problems to solve in some way. In the control group, the instructor solved the problems in front of the students, worked through them in a didactic lecturing way. In the active learning group, the students were put into small groups and asked to solve the problems themselves. In both cases, then, the instructor worked through the problems afterwards. So the only difference between the two groups is that in the active learning condition, the students solved the problem themselves, whereas in the control condition, the instructor did it for the students, did it in front of them. As in previous studies, students learned more in the active learning condition, but they enjoyed it less. They also said that they preferred the didactic lectures. They wished all of their teaching, in this case it was physics, could be done in this way. And perhaps most importantly, they rated the instructor as less effective in the active learning condition. Now this is a really important consideration from a pragmatic perspective when trying to decide whether or not to use active learning. Student evaluation of teaching, student feedback, is a fundamentally important part of higher education, medical and professional education in many countries around the world. Now, whether or not student feedback is a good way of evaluating the quality of teaching is probably a subject for a different video, but from a pragmatic perspective we can't ignore it. If students are rating your teaching as less effective, then that has potentially profound consequences for you personally and actually for the experience of your students and for your institution. There are also other related things that we have to factor in when considering active learning. This does lead us on to a related question about whether then instructors like active learning. Is it useful for them? Studies have found that instructors don't like using active learning or drop out of using it once they've started because students complain about it or students don't rate it very highly. In a separate study by Desloris back in 2011, they found that active learning materials take a lot of time to prepare, about 20 hours of preparation for one hour of class time, although that does go down as people become more used to preparing active learning materials. Nevertheless, from a pragmatic perspective, that's a lot of time to spend on class materials. If we're asking them whether active learning is useful, we do have to also reconsider the control condition. In the Deslauriers studies, and in lots of them as we've seen before, the control condition was a purely didactic lecture. The punchline then about whether or not active learning is useful, we do have to think about what we're comparing it against. Is it more useful to use a lecture or active learning? The question is probably more appropriate. Is it better to use a good lecture with some elements of interactivity, some quizzes, some mass produced tools that can be very commonly deployed to get the benefits of retrieval practice and engagement and interaction? Or do we want to use a full active learning setup? There are other pragmatic questions we have to think about in terms of the number of instructors, the amount of space and the amount of time. All of that also costs money. Now, I'm not here to tell you that it's a good or bad thing to spend money on the experience of your students, but we do have to recognise that from a pragmatic perspective, these are important questions. Overall, then, whether or not active learning is useful probably depends what you want to use it for and how you're going to use it. But using active learning in a large group lecture theatre setting, using some of the methods that we've talked about, basically employing some of the basic principles of retrieval practice is probably a useful and good thing to do. If you want to do something more sophisticated than that, probably going to require a lot more resource. And you are going to have to think about whether or not that's a useful and valuable thing for you to do, and whether there's an opportunity cost associated with getting all those additional instructors, that additional time, those additional spaces, whether you could be using those things for other purposes that are a bit more helpful to students. Here then are some of the references we've used in this video. Most of them are to the primary research that's cited, and there's a lot more references cited within those papers. If you have any questions about this video or about the MSc in Medical Education, please do send me an email and I'll see you in another video. Bye bye. <music>